Lost amidst the sharp ice peaks of Nanga Parbat, climber Tom Ballard recalled his mom. She hiked these mountains while carrying him in her belly and eventually perished on a neighboring summit. He always felt like he was in her shadow, but now the darkness consumed him at an altitude of 6,300 meters. No communication, no shelter, and no chance of rescue. Ballard no longer dreamed of surpassing his mother. All he wanted was to survive. Yet how do you make it through a winter night in the mountains with nothing but the sky above? Is it possible to find a safe route after a snowstorm? How do you signal for help? And why has Nanga Parbat been claiming climbers' lives for decades? As always, viewer discretion is advised. On Earth, there are 14 8,000ers, peaks exceeding 8,000 meters in height. They are all located in the Himalayas and Karakoram mountain ranges in Asia. Among them is Nanga Parbat, the ninth highest peak in the world at 8,126 meters. It's known as the Schicksalzberg der Deutschen, or Fateful Mountain for the Germans. Why did it earn this reputation? Well, let me tell you. In 1934, Germany organized a second expedition to conquer Nanga Parbat, led by Willy Merkel. His first attempt had failed. This time, he was accompanied by eight climbers and 35 Sherpas, experienced local guides. They followed the route of the first expedition, attempting to ascend the Rakoi face. The weather favored them, and within a few days, they established four camps, when suddenly, one of the strongest climbers in the team, Alfred Drexel, fell ill. He had to be descended, and despite the doctor's efforts, he died. The loss shocked the expedition members, but after the burial, they pressed on. The climbers set up the fifth camp near the base of the Rakuei Intermediate Peak, and with superhuman effort, ascended its icy wall in two days. There, they made another stop. However, only 11 Sherpas and five climbers proceeded further. They reached the Silver Saddle, a plateau at 7,451 meters, where the previous expedition had failed. After setting up the eighth camp, they managed to climb a few hundred meters more when suddenly, on July 7th, a powerful hurricane struck. The storm raged for two days, preventing any chance of continuing the ascent. So, the climbers had no choice but to descend. The most experienced in the group, Erwin Schneider and Peter Aschenbrenner led the way with three Sherpas, blazing a trail for Willy Merkel, Willy Welsenbach, Uli Weiland, and the rest of the guides. One of them almost got blown off the mountain when the wind inflated his sleeping bag like a parachute. Eventually, Aschenbrenner and Schneider's crew managed to descend below the seventh camp. The path got easier there, so the climbers unhooked from their Sherpas to blaze a trail faster. By evening, they barely made it to the fourth camp, where they waited for the rest, but no one followed them. For some unknown reason, three of their Sherpas stayed in the seventh camp, and the second group allegedly got lost, pitching bivouacs at 7,700 meters to shelter from the storm. Still, it didn't save everyone. One Sherpa froze to death during the night, and by morning, three more couldn't muster the strength to move on. Barely alive, Merkel and Weltenbach made it to the seventh camp and crawled into the last surviving tent. Meanwhile, Uli Weiland died from exhaustion just 30 meters from the shelter. Moreover, the Sherpas had nowhere to hide, so they decided to descend to a lower camp. However, darkness caught them halfway, and they had to spend another night in snow bivouacs. Every hour in the high mountains sapped more strength from those who had managed to survive. In the second half of July 10th, Aschenbrenner and Schneider from the fourth camp noticed that seven men were attempting to descend the icy wall of Rakia Peak. The climbers rushed to help, but due to the blizzard, they reached the fifth camp at the base of the peak only in the morning of July 12th. Throughout this time, the storm showed no mercy and continued to claim lives. Aschenbrenner and Schneider found a dead Sherpa just a few meters from the tent, and the bodies of two more guides froze right on the icy wall of Rakia. However, they didn't find Merkel and Welzenbach in this camp, realizing that their comrades were stuck higher up. For them, it was a death sentence. The storm intensified, and eventually, after five days, Welzenbach succumbed to the cold in the only tent of the seventh camp. Expedition leader Willie Merkel, with two Sherpas, struggled to make it to the lower camps, yet only one guide managed to descend. The surviving expedition members heard desperate cries from their comrades in the upper camps, but the powerful blizzard gave them no chance to go to their aid. So, when the voices fell silent on July 17th, it became clear that no one would return. This expedition was supposed to go down in history as the conquest of Nanga Parbat. 
Instead, it became known for the deaths of 10 people. Yet climbing this mountain became a matter of national honor for Germany. So in 1937, they sent another expedition, all 16 members of which perished in an avalanche. That's how Nanga Parbat got the name of the fateful mountain. But in reality, it became that for many people because despite the development of alpinism and technology, it continued to claim lives. Reinhold Messner, the greatest mountaineer of all time, experienced it firsthand. He was the first to conquer all 14 8,000ers, reach the summit of Everest without oxygen, and trekked across Antarctica and Greenland on foot. However, in May of 1970, when Reinhold was still a relatively unknown climber, he pulled off his first historic feat of Nanga Parbat. However, that expedition became a game changer in his life for a completely different reason. It was led by Karl Herlinghofer, the stepbrother of Willy Merkel, the head of the second German expedition. Unexpectedly, one team member dropped out, and Reinhold Messner was called in at the last minute. Moreover, another guy backed out right before, and Messner brought in his brother, Gunther, who even quit his job to join the Nanga Parbat climb. The expedition set off on an uncharted path, the southern Rupal face. It's almost 4,600 meters of exposed vertical rock, considered the longest in the world and downright suicidal in the world of mountaineering. Indeed, in the first few days, Herlikoffer's expedition lost one of the Sherpas and then got caught in a multi-day storm but the weather somewhat stabilized, giving the expedition another shot at conquering the summit. The climbers managed to set up the last camp just 915 meters from the top. However, by this time, they were so exhausted that no one had the strength to move on. No one except Reinhold. He decided to solo it to the summit in his favorite style, taking only a backpack and hardly bothering with protective ropes. Incredibly swiftly, Reinhold ascended the vertical ice wall, named after Willy Merkel. Suddenly, he noticed another climber approaching. It was his brother, Gunther, who was supposed to secure ropes for Reinhold's descent. However, the guy didn't want to miss the chance to summit Nanga Parbat himself. In the end, both brothers successfully reached the top. They congratulated each other and relished the triumph. However, in their joy, the climbers didn't realize they had lingered too long, and only an hour remained until nightfall. Reinhold shouted to his brother that it was time to go, but it turned out Gunther was completely drained. The guy could barely move and definitely couldn't descend the vertical Rupal face, as any mistake would mean a deadly fall. The Messners had no gear whatsoever, not even ropes. The events of the next few days completely changed the history of the two brothers and still remain the subject of speculation. Because after four days, Reinhold descended from the western side of the mountain, the unexplored Diamir face becoming the first person in history to do so, though the climber was barely alive and came back alone. Reinhold was delirious and, due to severe frostbite, lost seven toes. But when he came to his senses, he experienced much greater pain because he had to tell what happened to Gunther. Reinhold said they started descending the Diamir face because it was a much gentler route. However, it was extremely dangerous due to sharp ice seracs and constant avalanches. Reinhold led the way, breaking trail, and then called for Gunther. They moved like this for three days without water and food, spending nights in snow caves. Finally, Reinhold reached a safe clearing, leaving Gunther about a kilometer behind to rest and follow his tracks. But he never descended. So Reinhold returned to the spot where he left Gunther and was shocked. An avalanche had covered everything. The climber desperately dug through the snow for a whole day, hoping to find his brother. But Gunther was nowhere to be found. Hallucinations haunted Reinhold. He saw another climber beside him and felt detached from his own body. Yet Reinhold survived, and unexpectedly, accusations rained down on him from other expedition members. They claimed that Reinhold consciously prioritized his ambitions over saving his brother. Max von Kindlen and Hans Sailor insisted that Reinhold told them about a plan to descend from the other side of the mountain to make history, leaving exhausted Gunther on the summit himself. Messner returned to Nanga Parbat many times in search of his brother's body, but in vain. Accusations followed him for 35 years until, in July of 2005, remains were found a few kilometers from where Reinhold claimed Gunther disappeared. Messner headed to the Himalayas, recognizing his brother's clothing. Later, a DNA test confirmed it was indeed Gunther's body, although his second boot with the foot was only found in 2022. Scientists also study glacier movements 
confirming that the climber likely perished exactly where Reinhold said, eventually ending up where his remains were discovered. Still, this didn't change the fact that Messner lost his brother and lived with the guilt and accusations over his death. Even though both brothers were top-notch climbers, the mountains proved mightier. So maybe people just aren't adapted to such harsh conditions. On 8,000ers, the weather always remains unpredictable and unwelcoming, and Nanga Parba is no exception. Due to its location, this peak experiences prolonged and powerful storms and frequent avalanches. It's considered one of the most dangerous because about one in five climbers dies attempting the ascent. But Nanga Parbit, in winter, is an icy hell. The temperature at the summit drops below minus 45 degrees Celsius. With winds exceeding 160 kilometers per hour, it feels like minus 65. Planning a winter ascent of Nanga Parbit is practically signing your own death sentence. It's so challenging that climbers first succeeded only in 2016. Nanga Parbat ranked second to last among the 8,000ers, only behind K2. So, you get how tough it is to tackle Nanga Parbat in winter. That's why the Polish climber, Tomek Matskiewicz, decided to take on the challenge precisely during this season. He was a self-taught climber until he teamed up with another Polish guy, Marek Klanowski. Together, they started conquering increasingly difficult peaks, gearing up for the ultimate challenge, Nanga Parbat. Finally, in 2011, they made their first attempt. Unfortunately, reaching the summit eluded them, just like the next four tries. After that, Marek backed out from the idea of winter conquest, but Tomek wasn't about to back down. Preparing for the next attempt in 2016, he met up with the legendary climber, Elizabeth Revel. They joined forces for the ascent of Nanga Parbat, but bad weather thwarted their summit bid, so they returned the next year. It was her fourth attempt for Elizabeth, and for Tomek, it was the seventh. They set out on January 21st, 2018, tackling one of the most challenging routes, the Diamir Face. That's the same route where Reinhold Messner made history with the first descent and tragically lost his brother. So Tomek and Elizabeth were up against serious challenges. First, a brutal storm stranded them at the second camp for two nights. Then, extreme winds forced them to halt at an altitude of 6,900 meters, this climb was perhaps the toughest for both climbers, but eventually on January 25th, they reached the mark of 8,035 meters. It was already late, and they had to decide whether to descend for the night or take the risk of being on the summit in complete darkness. Staying put wasn't an option. They were in the death zone, above 8,000 meters, where the air is so thin that your body starts shutting down cell by cell. Oxygen deprivation can lead to lung or brain swelling, heart attacks, or strokes. But Tomek wasn't keen on turning back, so the climbers pressed on to the summit and eventually made it. Elizabeth became the first woman to conquer Nanga Parba in winter. She shouted in exhilaration and embraced Tomek. However, the moment of joy took a dark turn when Elizabeth noticed ice crystals forming in Tomek's eyes. Panic set in. The man had acute mountain sickness. He was going blind and essentially on the brink of death. Realizing the urgency, Elizabeth knew she had to get the blind Tomek down from one of the world's most perilous peaks before sundown. With each step, the climber's condition worsened. Blood oozed from his mouth, and his nose turned white from frostbite. Elizabeth managed to build a snow shelter and sent out an SMS plea for help. Meanwhile, the Polish expedition on the neighboring peak, K2, decided to halt their ascent to try and aid Elizabeth and Tomek. After two days of negotiations and political and financial hurdles, four climbers set out to search for the missing couple. They were dropped off by helicopters at an altitude of 4,800 meters. From there, they were to proceed independently, clueless about Tomek and Elizabeth's coordinates. Two climbers initiated a rapid ascent, disregarding safety rules. But after six hours, they only reached the second camp. Not being rescuers, they improvised a plan to continue ascending shouting Tomek and Elizabeth's name as loudly as possible. Suddenly, it seemed they heard a response. Dumbfounded, they doubted their ears until they actually saw Elizabeth, semi-conscious, frostbitten, and alone. She explained that she had left Tomek in a snow shelter higher up because he couldn't move anymore. The climbers understood they faced a gruesome choice, either try to find Tomek and likely doom Elizabeth, or not even attempt to rescue the missing pole. Realizing they couldn't help the guy if he couldn't move, the devastated climbers chose not to search for their fellow countrymen. 
They planned the descent, only to find that Elizabeth couldn't use her hands. Rescuers had to lower her on a rope. It proved so challenging and exhausting that it took them 10 hours to reach the helicopter. When Revel arrived at the hospital, she weighed only 45 kilograms, with severe frostbite on her hands. Still, her deepest pain was the loss of her friend. Elizabeth spoke of Tomek as an incredible person with a bigger heart than hers. His four children were left without a father, and he remained forever with his true love, the mountains. But if Tomek hadn't been obsessed with the idea of conquering Nanga Parbat in winter, he might have stayed alive. So can we truly blame the mountains for such a tragic outcome? For instance, Tom Ballard spent most of his life denying that he got into rock climbing because of his mom, Alison Hargreaves. She was the first woman to solo Everest, and Reinhold Messner thought she was the best female mountaineer ever. She climbed even when she was pregnant with Tom and eventually passed away on K2 when he was just six. Growing up, Ballard also got into solo climbing, realizing he'd been living in his mom's shadow. The guy wanted to change that, so when the opportunity to tackle Nanga Parbat in winter came up in 2019, he didn't hesitate. Ballard teamed up with the experienced Italian climber, Daniela Nardini, who'd been on a mountain with Elizabeth Revel before. But for Ballard, this expedition was a massive leap. He'd never climbed higher than 6,000 meters, and suddenly, he aimed not just for an 8,000er, but Nanga Parbat in winter. Moreover, they planned to take Mumri Spur, a route Messner himself called suicidal, and had only partially crossed it. Other expedition members flat out refused to go that way, but Ballard and Nardi kicked off their ascent solo. They lucked out, managing to set up three camps over a few sunny days, with the last one at 5,700 meters. But frequent avalanches kept forcing them down, burying their tents in snow each time. Once, Ballard and Nardi's instincts saved them from certain death, prompting them to abandon their chosen route minutes before an avalanche struck. Despite the obvious danger, they chose to keep moving forward. On the afternoon of February 24th, the men were at 6,300 meters when Nardi called the base camp using a satellite phone, stating they were descending due to an incoming storm. Later, he contacted his wife, and that was the last time anyone heard from Nardi or Ballard. Within days, the whole world knew about the disappearance because Tom was part of the British royal family. But bad weather and political turmoil in the region delayed search efforts. Only on March 3rd, just like with Tomek and Elizabeth, did other climbers from K2 set out to help. They couldn't climb the mountain. It was too deadly. So they scoured the slopes using powerful telescopes and drones. Finally, after two days, at 5,800 meters, Climbers spotted two unmoving bodies tied together with a rope. They were in such a tricky spot that confirming Nardi and Ballard's fate took a few more days. But recovering their remains has proven impossible till now. Yeah, Nanga Parbat is literally a killing machine. It's in the top three deadliest peaks globally. Up until 1990, the mortality rate on Nanga Parbat reached a record-breaking 77% among all 8,000ers. But truth be told, the mountain never did anything. It just peacefully stands there. It's people who relentlessly seek to conquer it, often paying with their own lives.